Bonjour. Anina Nishna Beduk. Mino Gijigad Nungum. Mandaman Indigena Kaz, Melanie Benjamin Indigu. Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you here today for this historical event. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Melanie Benjamin. I'm the Chief Executive Tribal Chairperson for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota. We have 11 tribes in the state of Minnesota, seven Ojibwe and four Dakota. And so today I also get the honor and the privilege of introducing Senator Klobuchar. And I want to tell you a little bit about her. We love her in the state of Minnesota. Amy has fought fiercely for our issues since day one. And I am very proud to talk about her accomplishments in law enforcement and education and health. Whatever those issues are, most recently the Savannah Act, Violence Against Women, that act. She's been at the forefront for a lot of these issues. So we have a lot of very strong advocates and we are very proud that Amy is our senator in the state of Minnesota because we know we can depend on her to get the job done. She understands tribal sovereignty. She understands where the boundaries of the reservations are. And she is an excellent advocate for our voice. And it is my honor and my privilege to introduce Senator Amy Klobuchar. Thanks to the chief executive. It is wonderful to be here with all of you in this beautiful theater uh, to talk about the important, important issues for Native American communities. So um, as Melanie mentioned, uh, Minnesota has a strong culture of tribal sovereignty. We have seven of our Chippewa Ojibwe communities and four Dakota communities. Uh, and when I was growing up, uh, it was mandatory that we understood uh, this culture. And uh, it's something that I have always had with me uh, my whole life. I actually um, was, uh, when I was writing in for my college applications, um, you were asked to talk about what the most important book, I was only 17, uh, was in your life. And I wrote about Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Um, I then um, went from there uh, and um, ended up um, getting a job as the county attorney for Minnesota's biggest county, elected to that job. And there I was in charge of all of our work, civil and criminal, in Minneapolis and the surrounding community. So I worked a lot with our urban Native American community. And one of the things I started understanding at that time, because I had a full-time lawyer um, for the Indian Child Welfare Act that worked on out of home placements and we made sure we always consulted with the tribes. And that lawyer would go around the state out of our county to be able to do that work. Um, I then got elected to the Senate and started working on Native American issues there. Uh, and I can promise you, uh, as your president, I will respect sovereignty and I will strongly believe in government to government negotiations and consultation, <laughs> that that is key. I am someone that has seen these challenges. Melanie uh, mentioned a number of them, but the challenge of what happens when uh, you don't have the resources uh, for law enforcement, the fact that half of our Native American women uh, have been sexually assaulted in some time in their life, the fact that we have people coming from outside of the reservations and committing crimes and that there was no justice. Uh, that is why I was one of the leaders uh, that refused to allow the Violence Against Women Act to come to the floor unless it had the jurisdictional change for our tribes. Um, we worked with leaders from all over the state and now we must expand on that. Uh, I also, uh, the Savannah's Law hits heart, close to my heart. It was right next door, uh, that bill uh, came out of something that happened in North Dakota uh, where Savannah's body was found abandoned in the Red River. It's just a horrific story, and it is what's motivated us to get this bill in, but now we have to pass it. Uh, it's, it's an outrage uh, that there are thousands of Native American uh, women that are just simply missing, wiped off the history 
wiped off the history books. And it is sadly history repeating itself in many ways, and we can't allow that to happen. I also have to say uh, that I have seen so many good things uh, in your culture and in your communities. I was able to see these strong women leaders get elected in our state, like Melanie Benjamin. I was able to be there for the inauguration of my good friend and supporter in my presidential campaign, the highest ranking Native American uh, elected executive in the country, Peggy Flanagan, the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota. And I was uh, so proud to have her out with me for uh, the first debate uh, that we had in Miami. I've also been able to see uh, the economic possibilities on uh, gaming, very important, but also other things in di diversifying economically, as Melanie has done, and that's things like um, buying hotels and other things, looking at renewable energy. Uh, I was the one that stood in front of the national prayer breakfast uh, to give uh, one of the prayers in front of the nation and actually chose to use uh, the Ojibwe, the Ojibwe prayer the prayer about making decisions, that leaders should make decisions not just for this generation, but for seven generations from now. And to me, that is all about climate, and it is about respecting our clean water and clean air, and respecting um, the simple idea that we have to do something to protect our environment. And the last thing I would say is I'll make one promise that you're gonna like. Have you ever heard of the sous chef from Minnesota? He's become very famous. He uh, was featured in the New York Times, a Native American chef uh, who has done very well for himself. I will make sure that he cooks a state dinner for America. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Senator. Our first question comes from Marcella Laveau. In translation, <clears throat> I chat, I uh, shake your hand with good heart. And my Lakota name is Pretty Rainbow Woman, as given to me by my grandmother when I was a child. I'm happy to know that you're here, and I like the words that you say in our favor. We've been a long, long time coming to this point. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my th throat is kind of raspy. I know what this is like, don't worry. <laughs> we, we need to go back to the doctrine of discovery. When the foreigners came in here, thinking that this land was all open and free, and our people were pushed back, and I suspect that's what happened to the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears that they came back to where we live in the South Dakota area. And my great-grandfather signed, we say signed, but he put his mark on the Fort Laramie Treaty, his Joseph Forbear, and he lived by that treaty, but others did not keep the treaty. They put him on, gave him allotment, an allotment land that was already treaty land it was already our land, and they put him there. He was to stay there, remain there. What kind of sense is that? To take your own land away and give it back to you and make you stay there. So all of these things have happened to our people. The boarding schools, another trauma. So we're learning that all of these traumas that have happened to our people are affecting us, our children, and our grandchildren today. And the, the reservations, some of them are like third world countries. Our roads are need repair. All of these things that are environmental, we need help. And so far, we haven't received the help that we deserve. The Black Hills are still ours by treaty. And even that, we owe a lot to the attorney, Mario Gonzalez, for the lawsuit. The, le the money is drawing interest in Congress. You know, we hear it's in the billions, but the Native people will not accept that money. We want our hills back, or fair and just 
treatment over it. So there are just a lot of things that have happened to Native American people. And our children, grandchildren, are suffering the traumas that have affected them in their lifetime, the poverty, all of these things that our grandchildren, some have to grow up in. And it's devastating. And I'm glad you're here addressing some of these issues. And I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. Um, I've always believed in listening to your elders, and, and you had so much to say. So I want to say, first of all, to assure you uh, that I respect treaty rights, and this means government to government negotiations and handling this in the right way. The second thing is child poverty that you touched on. And there was an Academy of Science report that came out just, a, just not that long ago that literally laid out how through uh, earned income tax credits and other smart policies that we can literally, and I have pledged to do this, cut child poverty in half in 10 years and completely eliminate child poverty in a generation. We can do this. We just have to set our mind to it as a country. You talked about our education system and uh, maybe the Leech Lake School in Minnesota um, was one of the saddest things. They had a tribal school uh, that I visited and Senator Franken also worked on this uh, for a long, long time. And I will never forget walking into that school and seeing hanging light fixtures, seeing discolored uh, ceiling panels, because of the water having come through. It smelled like mold. There was mold in the corner. There were rats in the corner. I tripped going on a regular school floor uh, because the floors had been buckling. No child should go to a school like this. And we worked, and because it became a national example, we were able to get the funding, and those kids now have a new school, all right? That is what we're talking about here, and we need to tell this story of the health care and the lack of resources and what's been happening across this country. And so the way I look at it, as we look at these big changes and things that we have to do with health care and with education and the environment, we just have to make sure uh, that we have someone leading the ticket, I believe it's me, uh, that is going to make sure that we have people's back when it comes to tribal issues. Good afternoon, my name is Amber Torres. I'm the thank chairman you. for the Walker River Paiute Tribe in Shures, Nevada. I thank you for coming because it shows me that you are hearing our voices and that our Indian initiatives are important to you. Um, the question that I have for you today is on dual taxation. Due to, due to the lack of federal clarification, courts have permitted states regulatory and tax authority within our tribal nations also known as dual taxation. The result has been catastrophic for tribal economies with nations having to litigate their own jurisdiction within states. If you are elected president, can you commit to confirming tribal tax and regulatory jurisdiction on our own tribal lands? Yes, I think that we must have, that the tribes must have jurisdiction over their own lands, um, including regulatory and, and you name it. We have to do that because one of the things that we've seen is, and this again is history repeating itself, so much of the resources going out of the tribes um, and going to other people. And I would extend that. I One thing I wanted to mention um, was the importance of uh, reversing um, that case, the Carcieri case. Um, the case involving the land and the trust, um, and where the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, actually ruled um, that that trust couldn't be made of the land, the tribal land. I think that has to change, and I think there should be changes when it comes to uh, taxation as well. Our next question comes from Larry Wright, Ponca Tribe. Oh, Ponca Moshe, Wongi, Ombele, a wiki, then go, Wibla Hoshi Dade. My name is Larry Wright Jr. I'm the chairman of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska. Uh, we were a terminated tribe in the 1960s and we were restored in 1990. We also we have uh, administrative offices just a few blocks from here in Sioux City. 
So on behalf of the Ponca people, our people that are here, uh, I welcome each and every one of you here. It's an honor to be here and be part of this. But Senator, thank you for coming uh, and, and being here today. Uh, my question is on language immersion and culture-based education. Uh, for us, uh, culture and language is one of the first things that uh, we lost as a people and being restored is one of the last things that we've been able to give back. Uh, we know that education has been a pillar of your campaign. Education can be transformative in many positive ways, but the boarding school era is a testament to the ways in which education can be and has been used by the United States to purposely destroy native people, cultures, traditions, and languages. Reversal of this federal policy and restoration of culture-based education and language immersion schools is imperative for our survival as a people. Some numbers uh, about education uh, in native country, as, as you may well know, there are 180 uh, plus BIE schools. 90% uh, of native children are in public schools and nine out of 10 tribes have no control over their education and what they receive from those state schools. To fix the, the underfunded schools, as you described, would cost $430 million across Indian country. Tribes are underfunded, underrepresented, those poor conditions that you described. You, you talked about a success in your state. If you were president, uh, wh what would you do to reverse the centuries of damaging federal policy and restore culture languages, culture and languages in our educational systems? It's a great question. Our culture starts at the top, and I can tell you, um, as your president, um, I'd stop the mean tweets, stop the mocking of American Indians, uh, and I would work to not demean the culture, but uplift the culture every single day. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, I would focus on, I already actually passed a bill um, as part of the um, American Succeeds Act, uh, which was the corrections to some of the No Child Left Behind bill that were such a problem, which included making sure that we work on retention of teachers um, at American Indian schools and tribal schools. I think that's very important. We want to have strong teachers in those schools, and we want to make sure they're paid enough to stay. Overall, with education policy, I would have the federal, I would, oh, I would get rid of Betsy DeVos. <laughs> um, and I would, um, I would make sure that we um, are paying teachers better, and I have a plan out there of how I'm going to do it, and that includes all schools. Um, and then school infrastructure, which gets to the story I told about Leech Lake. Um, but this, the uh, school infrastructure has got to be a piece of this. And I put out, actually I was the first candidate to put out an infrastructure plan um, for the country. And the president has said this, he said it on the night he got elected, that he wanted to do something on infrastructure. I'm actually going to follow through on it. Um, and I show how I'm going to pay for it, and it is going to include schools, uh, which it should. We have schools all over this country without heat uh, in uh, certain cities. We've had schools that have crumbled. We've had these tribal schools. So putting money into infrastructure, including roads on the reservations, right? Um, there was a Michigan uh, governor who just got elected in the last time who literally ran her own whole campaign on the slogan, fix the damn roads, okay? Um, and I think we could say that 10 times over uh, when it comes to tribal roads. And with education right now, you cannot educate kids in the modern world if you don't have access to high-speed internet. And I will never forget the story in one of our uh, reservations where a family was able to pay for high-speed internet and the mom looks out of the window and she sees all the kids in the front yard from the neighborhood. They were doing their homework because they had faster internet now that they could access in their house. So that should be available all over our country, including on tribal lands. If they can hook up the entire country of Iceland, I think we can hook up our Native American reservations to make sure in our tribal lands, to make sure that they have high-speed internet for our kids. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Again, my name is Shannon Holsey. I'm the president of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians from Wisconsin. I first want to thank you for your advocacy and support on, in Savannah's Act. It's so fundamentally important. And you were one of the first to stand with indigenous people. Um, and I know that you have great, a great deal of care and love for indigenous people because they represent a large part of your state that you represent and over the landscape of 573 federally recognized tribes. You spoke of earlier about the need for law enforcement and the fundamental resources associated with that. And of course, there's significant underfunding in all of those areas. So my question is, is would your administration as the president advocate for additional funding for US attorneys and federal law enforcement agencies to not only improve law enforcement in Indian country, but would it also support or consider the hiring of a, an assistant US attorneys dedicated solely to Indian country prosecutions? And probably most importantly, what is your position on the Oliphant and tribal jurisdiction over all persons on tribal lands? Thank you. That's a lot. Um, but of the first part of the questions, I would say yes. And I appreciate the depth of this question because uh, you get that a lot of this has to do with who's running these offices. Sometimes the laws are on the books and people just aren't using the laws in the right ways. And so I would make sure you start at the top um, that we put an attorney general in place in my administration that makes working with our tribes and helping our tribes a major priority, right? Out there, out front, talk about it publicly and make sure that this person who you're, when you interview people for this job, that they understand how important it is. From there, the attorney general picks the US attorneys in every jurisdiction. I know this, I was a county attorney for eight years. And so I was able to see firsthand in my elected job, that relationship between the US attorneys. Um, and we did have U.S. attorneys in my state that worked uh, with the tribes and took on the cases, but it's never perfect and you always have to improve it. So what I saw over the years uh, was not enough resources when it came to these sexual assault cases, and I briefly touched on that before. That means passing Savannah's law so we have better coordination between the tribes and our law enforcement so that we collect the data. The way I figure it, if my hometown company of Target can with a SKU number find a pair of shoes in Hawaii, we should be able to find Native American women that are missing in this country. It is absolutely absurd. So that is just simply where there's a will, there's a way. I believe this. You put people in these jobs that you say it's got to be a priority and it becomes a priority, including having assistants uh, that are devoted to this, passing the laws that matter. And the Oliphant case that you mentioned at the end, of course, this was the case that said that tribal jurisdictions couldn't prosecute non-native people. Uh, when they are on tribal land. And we reversed part of that, and it was a fight. We literally, uh, for a year, and I'm on the Judiciary Committee, held back our support for a version of the Violence Against Women Act that didn't have that in it, as well as two other provisions, one regarding immigrants, one regarding the LGBTQ community. And I still remember, I personally sat outside of a hearing to get Olympia Snow, who at the time was a Republican senator from Maine, to come out with me to speak because we were able to get at the time all, I think it was 20 women in the US Senate to take the same position that stuck with the stronger bill that included some reversal of that case and against the bill that didn't. And when every single woman senator says they won't budge, the world changes, all right? And we passed the stronger version. So. We got that done. Patty Murray was incredibly strong, if anyone's out there from Washington State, uh, when it came to that issue. And we got that done, and we worked on a bipartisan basis, which is how I've accomplished a lot of things in my world. So we get that done, and now I think we have to look at expanding at that as well as to other forms of violence against women, and the Violence Against Women Act is up for reauthorization. You should all know, uh, for those of you that care about protection of tribal women and women throughout this country, that that bill is currently hung up, the House passed that bill, hung up on Mitch McConnell's doorstep. Why? Because it includes my provision to close the boyfriend loophole. And that is the law, this is a gun issue, that says that right now, under current law, if a man is convicted of serious domestic abuse, he can't go out there and get an AK-47 or another gun. But he, if it's against his wife, if it's against his girlfriend, he can. 
think about what this means for vulnerable populations and how many of these dating partnerships and intimate relationships result in domestic homicides. So that includes Native women, it includes all women. So I just urge you to push Mitch McConnell to allow for the Violence Against Women Act up for a vote, which will include the help for the tribal issues as well. Thank you. The next question comes from Kevin Ellis, the executive or CEO of uh, the National Congress of American Indians. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank, thank Welcome you. Welcome to Indian Country and it's, thanks for it's coming. It's great to be here. I'm Kevin Ellis, as he said, with National Congress of American Indians, tribal member of the Forest County Pottawatomie Pot community in Wisconsin. So my question deals with health care. Uh, one of the most important provisions in the treaties between Indian tribes and this country, the federal government, has been an adequate and sufficient health care. But today, Native Americans suffer a life expectancy that's almost six years less than the rest of the country, and on some reservations, as high as 30. Also, with health disparities across the, across the spectrum, we suffer from conditions that are multiples of national average. Most of our, our community gets their care from Indian Health Services. Primarily, all of those that live on the re reservation do. Yet, it's chronically underfunded. The need to take care of everybody is estimated to be around $32 billion, yet we get a fraction of that every year. I think the annual cost for health care for a Native American is $3,200, three times less than the national average. So my question to you is, as president, what innovative approaches would you take to correct the issue that we have in healthcare in Indian country, and also what strategic measures will you take to increase the funding for such care? Well, I always figure a budget is a blueprint of our values as a nation. And so I would add money, obviously, to Indian healthcare. I would make sure that it is funded so that our population gets the healthcare that they need. Um, in terms of innovative approaches, I have always believed uh, that we need to move toward universal health care. And the Affordable Care Act was a beginning and not an end. Um, I have strongly and strenuously opposed uh, Donald Trump's ambitions to repeal the Affordable Care Act. There are tribal provisions in that bill that are very important uh, to protecting people's health care. Um, and I think we need to preserve that and then build on it. Uh, you mentioned some of the issues with the uh, lack of health care uh, in Native country, uh, but one of the things that I'd like to add to that um, is the lack of funding in our country for mental health and addiction issues. And that particularly has hit our Native American community strong. Um, one out of five people in this country have mental health problems sometime in their life, and in the Native communities, uh, the suicide rate, even though in the U.S., you ready for this number? beyond Native American in our whole country, it has increased by 30% in 15 years, the suicide rate, hitting even harder in Native American communities. So that is why I have put out a $100 billion plan for mental health, opioid addiction, and all forms of addiction. So I have worked very hard. And by the way, in Iowa, our friends from Iowa here, and they know this, there's so many people trying to work on this, there are only 64 mental health public beds in the entire state of Iowa right now. That is all there is. Because we went smartly from a, a, a state-based to community-based mental health care, but then we didn't follow with money and plans with how this was going to be implemented in so many places. So $100 billion. And let me tell you how I pay for this. And this is one of the most cynical things that has happened in our country um, in the last few years. And that is the dominance of pharmaceutical companies. They think they own Washington. They don't own me. And one of the things, the people that have most done egregious conduct in this area are those opioid manufacturers. They actually uncovered some emails that went public uh, recently that showed that some of their business people at one of the companies actually said it's like getting them, it's like getting the, eating Doritos. They just keep wanting to eat more of them. So we need to keep pumping them out. That's what happened. And you think of all the Native people uh, that have died because of this addiction. So when I look at how I pay for those mental health beds and help for addiction and help for mental health, I pay for it by saying to those companies that profited off 
of the death of people in this country and the continuing addiction, you pay for it. You made the money off of it. And that's how we bring in, you literally, a conservative estimate is we can bring in $40 billion from those law for lawsuits. Two cents per milligram tax on their products of opioids brings in another $40 billion. And they have some other things in there as well. But we just can't keep neglecting people like this. Because if we want to move to this economic, exciting opportunities we're talking about with renewable energy and with um, our, uh, the hope here that we have to elevate Native American culture, uh, the hope that we have uh, to diversify economically, we have to make sure our kids stop doing drugs, stop getting hooked, and are able to be mentally stable so they can move ahead. And you do that by putting the resources in and respecting the dignity of our Native communities. Thank you. Our next question comes from Elizabeth Day from the Native uh, Organizers Alliance. Uh, Hi, my name is Awanikwe, and Elizabeth Day is my English name. I'm from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and um, I, I live in Minneapolis now. And I'm from the Martin clan, and I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, my question has to do with the 2020 census and accurate representation um, around that. In April of 2020, our communities and citizens of our nations will be asked the question of how they racially identify. Being able to self-identify is essential to not only to one's own journey, but also to the shape of a community. And to that, being able to identify as more than one race is intrin intrinsic to a healthy community as our country continues to diversify. Historically, information shared with the federal government was used to systematically um, erase Native communities throughout cultural genocide and forced assimilation. So there's naturally an unwillingness to engage with the federal government. So there's a big job to do with building trust within the Native community and healing the generations of trauma caused by the federal government. The organization that I work for in Minneapolis, the Native American Community Development Institute, through our project Make Voting a Tradition, will be organizing to ensure full participation in the 2020 census. How would you and your administration show the Native community the value of participating in the 2020 census? And how will trust be built so that people feel safe to share their self-identified race so that an accurate count is accomplished? Oh, that's really good because uh, it's a good way to start talking about this as we head into this census. Um, and what has been really appalling is how this administration has politicized the census. Uh, the census is something um, uh, that this administration um, didn't invent, and they've only tried to mess with it. And I think you know how they were trying to put that citizenship question on there, uh, because they, were, they didn't want people to answer questions. Native American community, while it's unrelated to the citizenship question, it's the same kind of thing, because they don't want people to answer these questions. And I think the way we get around that is by assuring them, and this is what I will do as president, uh, that that information, of course, is confidential, that that information is used for good. It's used to make sure uh, that we know how many people of different races so people can self-identify are in our country so we understand it helps us to make decisions about resources that they should have. It helps us make decisions about voting, all kinds of things, infrastructure, and we need people to answer that census and they should feel comfortable answering it because it should be a census for good, not for bad. Um, and you need a president that actually says that and makes clear that that's the purpose. And thank you for organizing around the census. Miigwech. Miigwech. Question comes from Harold Frazier, Diane River. Thank you. This is Harold Frazier, Chairman of Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that uh, we've been faced with on our reservation, we're in the north central part of South Dakota, and uh, in our region too, in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, we've had a pretty tough spring with a lot of flooding. And one of the things that uh, has impacted us greatly is our roads. I mean, right now, today, um, it's just a travesty. 
the condition of our roads on our reservation. I mean, uh, there are several uh, issues that need to be dealt with. And there's a long-term solution and also a short-term. And uh, when you look at the short-term, it's pretty hard when you try to deal with federal highways to get uh, federal uh, disaster money when they won't even return your call. I mean, these floodings have been going on since um, April, damages to our roads. Right now on our reservation, we have five culverts that have washed out completely. So we have five detours on our reservation. We have a couple slide areas, um, so forth. Uh, the BIA come down and, and, and they couldn't believe the damage of our roads. And in two days, a bus is gonna be running down there. And I'll tell you what, nobody cares. Nobody cares. It's a shameful to see the neglect in your own backyard and you see the millions of dollars that are being played with. The 4th of July parade is one example. But yet, they can't even fund to fix roads on reservation. You know, what good is having, a, I mean, you talk about school, I mean, that's good. But talk is talk. And we have seen nothing from anybody, from Federal Highways to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, nobody. And, um, you know, till I see something happen, I have, I have no faith in the federal government. You know, we've been lied to enough, and, and that needs to stop. You know, I mean, it's just all lip service. I've been all over in Washington. I've been out into Indian country. I went to a lot of areas to uh, drum up support to bring up this issue. And yet, um, you know what I mean, I don't see anything. I see not only there's a tribe down the southwest um, probably a uh, second largest uh, reservation in the United States, and, and they only have two BIA maintenance workers, road maintenance workers. I mean, it's just shameful. Here's how they fix the road. They put a sign. Half the road's oh, gone. Down. Half the road's gone. Yeah, we have a road on our reservation, BIA Route 9, that has been closed since May 26. And who cares? And who All cares? Right. I mean, I could go on. There was some fatalities up in uh, Standing Rock. You know, and the story of that one is the BIA knew about it. The paperwork was sitting in the area office so they could draw it down and start moving to repair that culvert. Two people died. And you know what? Nobody cares. Nobody cares in Washington. Nobody cares anywhere because there's been no positive feedback. There's nothing coming down. Okay, so I care. Um, and in fact, I think Melanie would vouch for me. And one of the things that I have done uh, in my state is that I go to the reservations routinely. I visit every county every single year, the smallest, reddest counties, the uh, most impoverished counties in rural areas. And I do that uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to see with your own eyes and bring back the stories to try to fix things. And I use the story of the tribal school because that's something we did together, our delegation. And we did it because we made a big deal out of it and people started to feel embarrassed about it and they acted. And the reason I brought up roads early with fix the damn roads is because I understand that, that you are not gonna be able uh, to conduct commerce or have any kind of economic opportunity or people aren't gonna wanna stay on your lands if you don't have roads. So my two solutions when it comes to uh, this infrastructure issue. The first one, as you say, is immediate and that's putting the actual money into it. I put this trillion dollar plan out and it's paid for every dime of it. And it is paid for by first of all, taking the Trump tax cuts, where all this money went to the top 1% and taking that corporate tax rate, which was went way down faster than anyone ever thought to 21%. Even if you put it at 25%, which I think the business thought it was gonna be anyway, that gets you $400 billion right there. Then you get another $150 billion by going back to the way they did the international taxes before. You can do an infrastructure financing authority that brings in a couple hundred billion. You can do that and make sure the tribal communities are included in those, uh, that financing. And then you also can do some uh, government bonds. You have to get this done and you have to make sure the tribal communities are included and make sure green infrastructure, which brings me to the second solution, which is taking on the issue of climate change. Because as you know, some of this flooding is getting worse uh, because our country didn't have the same respect 
uh, for our environment that your tribal community has. Um, first of all, we are now the only country in the world that is not in the International Climate Change Agreement. When Donald Trump announced he was getting us out of that, it was Nicaragua and Syria weren't in it. Now they got in it. We are the only ones. And yes, and on day, okay. On, thank you. And on day one, I will get us into that international climate change agreement and work on those environmental issues. So I think that, as well as putting the money into infrastructure, has got to be a major priority as we go forward. All right. Well, I'm personally going to invite you okay. to come to our reservation. I will. And you see okay. the condition of these roads. Okay. And, and when I mentioned the when I mentioned the other uh, the other solution. Anyway, um, the other part, and, and we got historical data to prove this. I mean, nationally, the budget has doubled. But yet, on the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, because of this formula, we still receive $2.2 million. So you could put a $500 billion in there, I'll guarantee you we're still going to receive $2.2 million. And when you got all these issues of these roads, like I, I, I want to remind you, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation is the fourth largest in, in Indian country. And to receive that, it, it, it's almost criminal. So the EPD, EPW committee just sent out a draft of the bill. I'd ask you to read it. And it's really shameful and disheartening to see that there's a provision in that bill is to uh, take care of wildlife at 250 million a year. But yet the entire road budget within the Indian country is at 500. So it's like they're putting wildlife ahead of human lives, and that needs to stop. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator. Melanie Benjamin, Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota. And uh, I wanted to start out today um, thanking all the panelists. I, uh, as you can see, in Indian country, we have a lot, a lot of talent and people that are very committed to their communities and wanting to make life better. What we call in our culture, the Madiziwin, which is the good life. And we want to make sure that we have safe communities, our kids are educated in the best possible way, healthcare is very important, and, and our elders. Of course, we wanna make sure that we always take care of our elders. And so I also wanted to note that I'm very thankful of how we started this event today. We had ceremony, we had prayer, we had our veterans, and I'm very grateful and that we still have that very respectful culture when we're dealing with our issues. And um, one of the big issues that I see in the country today is this whole issue of opioids. And we've had numerous deaths and um, in every payday, a lot of times we see the ambulance coming to the community because someone has um, died or is under that whole overdose kind of environment. So there's a lot of opioids, meth, heroin, alcoholism, and things like that uh, that come when there's a lack of law, law enforcement on your reservations and then the drug dealers, gang violence, and high crime rates kind of um, show up and then um, we know this is kind of an epidemic across the country as, as well. So how would a Klobuchar administration deal with the opioids at the federal level? And, what, and I know what, what was pretty cool about this discussion, you jumped on all these topics already. And, uh, and you also uh, mentioned the uh, getting more funding to law enforcement and federal prosecutors to deal with the gangs and violence and the drug dealers. And But most importantly, we want to have the opportunities to help heal our communities, to make sure that we have culture and language available so that we can provide that self-esteem and that pride into our youth. And so I really appreciate your, uh, the conversation we had today, and those are my issues. Miigwech. Uh, thank you. Um, this uh, opioid epidemic, which I've touched on before, um, has just affected everyone, no matter if they're Prince, uh, who we lost in Minnesota, uh, celebrities like him, or whether it is a high school swimmer in a small town, or whether it is a young man um, on Mille Lacs Reservation. We have lost so many people. 
uh, because of this epidemic. Uh, for me, this is personal. Uh, my uh, dad, when I was growing up, uh, he struggled with alcoholism. And by the time I was getting married, he had not one, not two, but three DWIs. And by the time he had the third DWI, it was no longer the 70s or the 80s, uh, it was the 90s, and the laws had changed. And he was given a choice, treatment or jail. Uh, and thank God for us and for him, he picked treatment. And in his words, he was pursued by grace uh, because of his faith, because of his, um, the treatment he got and the community. And I truly believe uh, that every single person in this country, including our tribal members, have the right to be pursued by grace. Uh, they have the right to get through these addictions and these demons that can get in your heads, and they have the right uh, to get through this. My dad is now, because of that treatment, he was sober for decades. He's now 91, uh, and he is in assisted living, as he, as he told me about a year ago. Uh, the AA group still visits him there, but it's hard to get a drink there anyway. Um, and so I just think it's really important as we take on these addiction issues uh, that it is not just one size fits all, that we understand that the treatment on some of our uh, tribal lands, there might be different things that work, and we have to acknowledge that so we tailor it. I think we also have to understand that it's not just opioids. There are still many tribal members that struggle with alcohol, uh, that struggle with meth, uh, that struggle with uh, crack cocaine and some of these other drugs so that we make sure when this money starts coming in for opioid treatment that it's shared with tribal communities, but it also covers these other forms of addiction because otherwise we're gonna have all the money going into one thing um, and not the other thing. And then the very last thing I wanna say, because I think we're probably running out of time, um, is how we get all of this done. And we are not gonna be able to get all this done unless everyone votes, right? Right, here we go. Every native vote counts. Um, and we're not gonna have, we're not gonna have everyone vote if we make it too hard to vote. And one of the things that I will pledge to you, the Native American um, uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, we will get this done. Uh, we will reauthorize uh, the Voting Rights Act, which covers all of this discrimination that's been going on in this country. Uh, the fact uh, that we had what we had in North Dakota, I remember my good friend Heidi Heitkamp, who I worked with on human trafficking issues, talking to me about this. The fact that you had um, people in North Dakota that couldn't vote because they said they didn't have an address that was right because they lived on a reservation or that you had what you had in Nevada. I just did a, a letter on this and on some of the other issues coming out of this. People that have to go 100 miles uh, to get to a polling location. That is not the right to vote. And we have a president right now uh, who does everything to try to make it harder for people to vote, right? He puts in judges that aren't good on voting. Uh, he um, allows this gerrymandering uh, to continue in states. Um, I personally think when every kid turns 18 that's eligible to vote across the country, they should be automatically registered to vote. And that would take care of, that is my bill that I'm leading, and as president, I could get it done. Uh, voting security, yes, that's important, but in the Native communities right now, it's just being able to get to a polling location and having a polling locations that open and making sure that you get counted. Um, I'm someone that doesn't come from money. I don't come from a lot of money myself and my husband. Uh, he grew up in a trailer court, one of six boys in triple bunk beds in a single trailer in Mankato, Minnesota, where, by the way, uh, he wrote a book about that worst hanging in American history of the, of the American Indians in his, uh, in his town. And that's what got him interested in his life's work. But he grew up in that trailer court, so I can tell you right now, I'm not from money, I didn't marry into money, I care a lot about allowing people to run for office, to get into office like one Peggy Flanagan uh, without coming from a lot of money, that everyone has a right to run for office, everyone has a right to vote, and we need to bring fairness back into our democracy, and that is how we win. So get every Native American vote out, inspire people, there is, if they wanna be inspired by Donald Trump's mean tweets, fine but inspire them by the hope of where we can be, where we can be economically and where our country can go. Let's go out there and win. I'd love your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, and thank you to our panel.